Life in a Late Woodland Indian Village in Michigan, Part 6, Education of the Young, by Dennis M. Morrison. <clears throat> in preparing this series, one thing I really wanted to show is that basically the Late Woodland Indians were not much different than we are today. In fact, as I walk the streets of Saginaw where I live, I would say that the people uh, that lived here 1,400 years ago were our superiors in many, many very basic ways. In part six, I want to take a look at education. How did the late woodland people teach their children? I remember in working at Old Vanetten Creek site in Oscoda that I came across numerous artifacts that were clearly instructional in nature, but more on those a bit later. Of course, the late woodland people did not have books, um, nor as far as is known did they have any form of writing. The minds of the adults served as living textbooks to pass on vital knowledge to the next generation. The storyteller, for example, served as a history teacher, so to speak. Now, I'm only guessing, but I would imagine most villages had a storyteller whose job it was to orally communicate great historic tales and ingrain in the minds of the youth um, tales of their heritage. <clears throat> in his book, First People of Michigan, W.B. Hinsdale wrote the following. Folkways, among all grades of culture, are largely taught by unconscious suggestion. A young girl of ordinary intelligence does not need to be taught how to use a broom, or a boy how to drive a stake in the ground. All children learn by casual observation, and attain proficiency by imitation. In a culture which is without an alphabet, or other means for perpetuating tribal history, or keeping records, the memory becomes greatly developed and achieves a marvelous degree of accuracy. Hinsdale continued, the Indians had traditions, stories, rituals, accounts of previous events to which they attached the greatest importance as part of their social life. A man who knows how to write, Hinsdale points out, can jot down important items and forget them depending upon his memoranda for refreshing his memory, but the man who cannot write has no such device. The tablets of his mind are his daybook, ledger, <coughs> and historical record, end quote. In times past, when I would think of the Indian, I, I never thought about how one became a chief or a medicine man. I go to Hinsdale often, and here I'm going to again. He had some interesting thoughts and insights. On this he wrote, the Indian boy, if he aspired to be a chief, a medicine man, a great warrior, a skillful hunter, or in some way to exercise an influence in his village, had to undergo as rigid a training as any nevotate for the priesthood. If one could have asked an Indian <clears throat> how he acted in certain cases as he did, he would have answered that his ancestors did so. The nearer one approaches to what we call the primitive forms of society, the more he will observe the customs, traditions, and conformity are less elastic and culture less dynamic. It is easy, in quote, by the way, it is easy to assume that the villagers at my old Manhattan Creek site took great pride in their ancestors as they carried out uh, to pretty exacting standards customs of making arrowheads, stone packing, canoe making, pottery making, and so on. The Indian not only had to learn what to do and when to do it, but uh, there were many things that he must not do or do at a certain time and under very strict attention to rules. In late woodland life, the people had many superstitious beliefs. Everyone, or every important event, was according to ritual, not a published list of regulations. No, rather rigid codes of social customs which evolved over generations. An early teen male Native American of the woodlands knew more vital facts, life skills, and survival skills than any modern boy could. Tossed out on their own, they would survive because of their education. When the power grid which makes our life possible today fails, and at some point it likely will, how many adults or our young people will have the education to survive? Are we highly advanced because of our computers and other electronics? Certainly not. If all that failed, we would become truly savage and survive by plundering, stealing, and yes, even killing. We, for the most part, have no connection uh, to survival skills that our ancestors had, as the Native American had, and was the basis of their education. <clears throat> if I were to outline the late woodland educational basics for hunting alone, just for hunting, 
it would look much like this. Number one, general rules applying to all kinds of hunting. Two, the making of arrows and spears and other lithics. Three, how to use particular implements for a spe specific purpose. Four, preparation for the hunt. Five, knowledge about traps and trapping. Six, how to go through woods without making sounds. Seven, how to hunt in the day and, and at night. Keep in mind this is just considering the subject of hunting. Things would then get more specific. For example, how to track deer, time of the year to hunt deer, time of the day when success would be best, how to approach deer without scaring them, using the arrows, skinning, prepping for cook, prepping for preserving, um, tanning the skins, and, and many other topics. And this would just be for the one occupation of hunting, and then specifically for hunting the deer. In each of these, remember, an adult was uh, the living textbook. An adult taught how to make pottery, to cook, to do agriculture, to fish, and literally hundreds of other subjects the Native American of the late woodland or any other era needed to know. These were essential to survival. That the children learned by following what an elder taught them could clearly be seen at the old Manhattan Creek site in, uh, in both the making of pottery and the production of arrowheads. I personally found, based on rim shards, the remains of over 1,500 pottery vessels at Old Manhattan Creek. Among them, the majority were very nicely crafted and well made by a lady with much experience and skill. In many cases, right alongside with pot, with, uh, were pots of a very inferior quality, crude decorative techniques, inconsistent thickness. These bespoke of a young person's early attempts in learning the necessary art of pottery construction. I remember one little pot which was no bigger around than a quarter and less than a half an inch tall, very crude, with a stick poked in the center to form the uh, the depression. Or, um, the depression. Um, this was without question a first or early attempt at a young girl to learn pottery. The educational process for this alone would have had to be most complex and of vital importance to the sedentary lifestyle of the late woodland people. For pottery containers made it possible to store foods during time of abundance so the community did not have to be constantly on the move looking for daily food sources. Likewise, with arrow point production, arrows are primarily made of chert, a very, very hard stone. And only once did I see a deviation from this at Old Manhattan Creek, and I believe that was a point made by a student, so to speak. I was digging and finding the, the uh, fragments of a very soft shale or slate. It was black in color and about five inches down in the ground, <clears throat> near the railroad tracks. I found one quite remarkable arrowhead made of this material, and it did not resemble any known form. I was, uh, it was obviously a practice piece. It measured about a half an inch long and was about as thick as maybe two pieces of typing paper. It was notched, but the base flared and was lopsided. It could have never served a functional purpose and was quite uh, so obviously a practice piece. Fired from a, from a bow, it would have shattered and done n absolutely no um, damage to what was being aimed at. These two illustrations, one with pottery and the other with uh, the arrowhead, shows some basics about education at Old Manhattan Creek and other late woodland sites. I already spoke briefly about the storyteller of the village and his role as a sort of living history book. I again go back to Hinsdale, who had some interesting concepts on the life stories uh, and their part in, the, in training the late woodland children. Hinsdale wrote, and I quote, Story, Storytelling was, use, was a useful means of education. Around the campfire, in the lodges, upon special occasions, at ceremonial festivals, by myth, fable, fiction, allegory, and the narration of actual exploits, the children absorbed lore and many absorbed lore and history of their ancestors, both immediate and remote. If these narrations, which upon occasion amounted to real or orations, had been reduced to writing, they would deserve to be called literature. At the grade of culture our Michigan Indians had attained, <clears throat> the family was an important educational institution. Hinsdale continued, the young Indian finally came to a time when he took his graduate course for which, from his infancy, the lectures and stories of the lodge and campfire together with practical instructions had re that he had received prepared him for. Spirituality and instruction in it was begun nearly at infancy. Um, by the way, that was an end quote. 
It was a vital part of their existence. In their very early teen years, they were taught life would have a spe in life they would have a special dream, today referred to as a vision quest. In this dream, he would become aware of who would be his personal Manitu or guardian and spiritual guide and educator through his entire life. To attain this dream took special instruction, and the youth, fast and um, in isolation, would have his special vi um, special vision. Religious instruction used to have high importance in our society, and its downfall has led in part to the moral decay which infects our society from youth to adult. In late woodland uh, life, religious spiritual instruction was vital, and its role cannot be overstated. But including in concluding this presentation, though, I must one more time turn to Mr. Hinsdale, who summed things up as follows. One may consider for a moment what the untutored Native American taught the people who came to take his place in the files of time. He pointed out the paths through the trackless wilderness and how to get through without the use of a compass. He showed the places where food animals could be captured and how to trail them, where the sturgeon could be pulled out of the waters and other fish um, be able to be taken by net, spear, and hook. He led to the hunts uh, or to the haunts of fur-bearing animals and gave lessons in canoe building and the making of snowshoes. The white man took over the entire routine of the corn culture from the Indians and learned from them how to make sugar from the sap of maple trees. The Indian located the places where copper could be mined in an almost pure state. Words have been added to our language from the speech of the Indians." End quote. Education though carried out differently, was as vital to the late woodland Indian as a college degree is to a young person today, and I would dare say it was even more important because his very survival depended on it, not only his, but his family and his village. I want to tell you of another artifact I found at Opanetan Creek in Oscoda. I believe it carried a lot of significance in education of, of um, one particular area, though. I'm sure what I'm going to say would be ridiculed by professional archaeologists because it, uh, well, was not discovered by one of their own. And thus, it has no basis in reality, so to speak. By the way, before I tell you about this artifact, which I believe to be one of Michigan's very earliest maps, let me tell you a little about what has become of it. This artifact ended up in the collections of the Ascota Asabo Historical Society. Um, they, uh, years ago, obtained my collection from me during a really nasty divorce, and I also gave them, or provided them with all of my field notes and everything. With no notation of its significance, it was in a collection of other artifacts displayed there labeled Finds by Area Residents. I had spent literally hundreds of hours alone at Ovenetten Creek and had pr provided the sci society with copies of, of um, all my field notes. But rather than having me put uh, the um, pertinent information with some very significant artifacts, they just lumped them all together. Uh, they were found by area residents. Big whoopee frickin' deal. If you don't have the story behind them, and you don't know what they are, how can you properly display them, and how can you, it just, it, it very, it's very frustrating, because that one artifact is so highly significant, and no notation at all, when I saw it last, which was a couple years ago, as to what it was. If you have a significant collection, truly the information preserved, uh, you, you would want the information preserved. I would never let it go ever again. A collection to a local historical society where a few people pretend to know what historic preservation is all about. All useful information I could have provided them with has never been sought or desired, and in the past I have been in contact with them. Every personal detail that I could give about every artifact I took from the ground, there seems to be no interest in. Anyways. Having said that, the artifact in question is a lightweight tan stone about the size of an average adult hand. It has a hole in one end that goes all the way through, and it also has on, the, on, on it some very light line etching. It again is from the late woodland at Open and Creek. When I originally found this, I totally missed the true importance of it, believing it to be nothing more than a gorge with some prehistoric doodling on it. I believe now, I know, 
it was much, much more than that. To me, without question, it is a map of Bennett Lake. The drilled area of the pendant represents the north end of, the, of Bennett Lake and the island there. The lines around it, I believe, clearly shows the major trails around the lake, particularly at the south end where Vinette and Creek enters the lake. A very rare piece and an educational piece to the, to the people who were using it. This would be a truly rare example of an educational piece from Muscota, Michigan some 1,400 years ago. It would have been highly significant to the person who crafted it, for it preserved knowledge for himself and others to use. Its significance is lost, though, because of being in the collection of a local historical society has no interest in this rare and significant piece, which was, when I last saw it, as I said, about six, maybe, well, maybe, I think it was about six years ago, actually, was just randomly lumped in with a few other artifacts displayed found by area residents. And it pisses me off. Because, yes, a lot of area residents make a few little finds here and there, don't, don't care about the knowledge that, um, that can be preserved, and just pick it up and give it to the historical society. Fine, fine, hunky-dunky. That makes a nice display. But where the value is, is in not just in the artifact, but is in the information preserved. And just like the living history books, the storytellers of the tribes... The history of every artifact there that I took out of the ground, which numbers in thousands, is in my mind. Anyways, I'm sorry about that tangent. Hope you enjoyed this a little bit about the um, education in, in uh, Late Woodland Society. And I will bring you another video on life in a Late Woodland village in Michigan very soon. Thanks for taking a listen. And I hope I didn't offend too many people.